Good morning. I, <laughs> I'm Vanessa Broadhurst, Executive Vice President of Global Corporate Affairs at Johnson & Johnson, and I'm so pleased that this conversation is happening here at Aspen Ideas because we're in the midst of a real healthcare crisis, one that we can help overcome together, but one that unfortunately does not always receive the attention that it deserves. In fact, according to a recent article on COVID-related stress in the US, healthcare workers, US healthcare workers, 20% of physicians and 40% of surveyed nurses actually intend to leave their practice within two years, mm -hmm. essentially taking with them millions of years of knowledge. Stats like this are absolutely concerning, as is the loss of qualified healthcare workers, because it has a negative impact on patient care that we hear about daily from customers across the country who are forced to delay procedures or otherwise adjust their care. These shortages are acute amongst healthcare workers of color, which exacerbates historical inequities as well. So meanwhile, the cost is very real to nurses and physicians themselves, their loved ones, from changing careers to coping with disproportionate workplace violence to managing high, increasing, and often acute mental health challenges. So bringing in more nurses and physicians to healthcare must be complemented by a hard look to drive change and to address the fundamental issues that are occurring behind why they are leaving the profession. At Johnson & Johnson, we're convening partners and experts across the healthcare ecosystem through our Center for Health Worker Innovation to share perspective and find solutions. We are strong advocates for fundamental the fundamental value of nurses in particular as the backbone of the healthcare workforce. So how can we best use our voices to support our exhausted healthcare workers and attract the next generation? How do we take on the foundational issues that undermine, undermine a positive healthcare work environment? So I'm really very eager to hear the ideas of these remarkable leaders. And I encourage all of you to become strong advocates for supporting our healthcare, frontline healthcare workers. And because I know, I know in fact that you'll be very inspired by this session, um, I hope you'll also join us this afternoon at four for a discussion on the healthcare crisis and why we should absolutely care <coughs> when nurses leave. And this evening at 5.30 p.m., as nurses and physicians will share in their own voice why they have chosen careers at the point of care. So I hope you'll stop by our tent on the lawn to find out more about our amazing partners pursuing solutions and explore the Back the Frontline Healthcare Action Hub full of small and big actions that we can all take to lend a hand. So with that, I thank you, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our panel. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Vanessa, for those opening remarks. Um, I have uh, the distinct privilege of getting to introduce uh, our speakers for, uh, for this wonderful session. Um, and to add uh, just a bit to what Vanessa has said, it's, it's hard to think about uh, a topic that is more important or fundamental to everything else that we're talking about during Aspen Ideas Health. Uh, because without health workers, uh, there is no health care, uh, and there is no health system. Uh, we have people who have not just thought about this, they have lived it in so many ways. So, uh, so it's my privilege to get to introduce them. Uh, first is Dr. Adrian Billings. Um, Adrian is a rural family medicine physician. That means he takes care of patients uh, across all ages of life, um, from childhood to, to old age. Uh, he does it in a clinic, in a hospital, um, and he does it uh, in uh, some uh, extraordinary circumstances. Uh, he practices in West Texas, close to the uh, Texas and Mexico border. Um, next to Adrian is Dr. Sandra Lindsay. Sandra is a critical care nurse uh, and a nurse leader at Northwell Health. 
Uh, she's a fellow New Yorker, like I am, and she bears the distinction of having been the first person in the United States to have received the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and next to Sandra is Dr. Shaban Westcott. Uh, Shaban is a professor and the director of American Indian Health at the University of Nebraska. Uh, as many of you may have heard last night during the opening uh, reception, she is a fierce advocate for health equity, um, and particularly for the health of Native Americans, stemming from her Alaska Native roots. So welcome to all of the speakers. Uh, briefly, I'll, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dave Choksi. Uh, I had the honor of serving as New York City's health commissioner until March of this year, and I'm a primary care doctor at Bellevue Hospital. Um, we are going to keep this session lively and interesting, and we're going to get to your questions as well. So, um, so let me just dive right in with, uh, with my first question, uh, which is for Shaban. Um, we're going to get into the pandemic uh, a little bit later and, and what comes next, but as we know, the truth is that uh, health workers have been sending out an SOS signal for, uh, for years, if not decades. Uh, there was an article in STAT in 2018 which termed uh, one of the fundamental causes of this moral injury, mm -hmm. moral injury. Um, the authors defined it simply as being unable to provide healing in the context of healthcare and pointed to our broken administrative payment and technological systems as the sources uh, of that injury. So uh, to start, how much of what we're experiencing right now during the pandemic and afterward is actually because of those broken systems from long before? I would say 95%. It's a very broken system and I will start taking aim right away by the way, in case you haven't already guessed, my pronouns are she, her, badass. Uh, those, were, those were given to me. But uh, if, if you've ever tried to use an electronic health record, uh, you will appreciate this data. Uh, ranking digital programs, it was the only one that was an F. An A was for Google search, and GPS was in the middle of a C. But these were designed by billers, they were not designed by healers, and it shows. And the amount of work that doctors and sometimes even nurses have to do in order to keep up with the records, that's where there's an issue because you get paid for visits. You don't get paid for now, there's lots of ways to have back and forth with the patient, and that's where I think we need a revolution in billing in that you're not billing just for visits or procedures, but you're bill billing for interactions with the patients, because that's what, you've got to have long-term, you've got to have healing interactions, and sometimes that's a message on your one chart. So that is um, one of the ways that we really need to improve things, because it is, um, I understand it makes things easier, and I still, I was at that bridge where I would still order paper charts you know, you had to wait for it to come up from the storage room. So all of that, uh, I've seen both worlds, and this, this new digital world has failed the healthcare system, and it's failing the healthcare workers. I think an important point in that is that even when we talk about administrative uh, hurdles or technological or the reimbursement hurdles, they're all tied together, um, and we'll try to disentangle some of that. Adrian or Sandra, anything else that you want to um, share in terms of the experience before COVID-19 that, um, that has reverberated today? Yeah, just to um, add to Siobhan's um, you know, assessment of the electronic health record, um, we thought as nurses it was going to make our lives easier, but it's actually taken us away from the patient. We need to get closer to the patient um, that's how we impact and influence care and can, you know, practice the art and the science of nursing. And um, we feel like we are healing, basically, the technology and not our patients. I would agree. You know, it makes me think of one of the airports that we travel through to get here. Um, I saw a quote from Coretta Scott King, and, and I'm going to slaughter the quote, so don't hold me to this, but maybe look it up. 
but it was something to the point. The measure of a society's good is their efforts to create empathetic actions, mm -hmm. not just empathy. We, we hope that all of us that go into healthcare, we have empathy, that we arrive to our healthcare training uh, school with some sort of ingrained empathy that we were either was innate within us or we've learned from the nurturers in our life. And I certainly think that the electronic health records make it very difficult because we're spending over 50% of our patient in encounters for the most part um, doctoring or nursing the electronic health record rather than trying to show empathetic actions towards the patient who is seated across from us. So bringing it forward um, to uh, the experience that all of us had during COVID-19, uh, and Sandra, I'd like to start with you. Um, you know, one of the memories that I have from the pandemic, I was actually sitting down with the head of the nurses union in New York. Um, I was trying to enlist her help in our vaccination campaign, including in getting more nurses vaccinated because as you well know, not, um, not all nurses were quite as ready to get vaccinated uh, as you were. Um, and the thing that she was imparting to me was the profound loss of trust uh, that so many nurses felt, uh, particularly during that devastating first wave in New York City where um, there were failures with respect to PPE, um, and there were failures with respect to uh, not protecting and looking after uh, nurses. So can you share a little bit about your experience during COVID-19? Sure, so before I get into my experience, I'd just like to say thank you to all healthcare workers, my nurses who worked tirelessly um, during the first wave and continue to show up today despite the exhaustion and the tremendous pressures and stress that we are under. And thank you to our allies and supporters like Johnson & Johnson, who um, have always been there with us and continue to be there with us. Um, so uh, my experience on March 7th is when I remember we got our first patient into in the intensive care unit at the organization where I work and, you know, by March 13th, I was meeting with my team to say, this is not looking good. We need to expand ICU capacity, um, and we need to be at work on Saturday, March 14, 2020, to um, make that happen. So we, we met at work on, on the 14th, um, opened up 12 more ICU beds in addition to the 48 which we had, and by Monday, March 16th, it was a different place. Mm -hmm. um, it was volumes and volumes of patients just coming into the doors, gasping for air. It was hard to watch. Um, and we were just running. It was heels off, clogs on, scrubs on. They're still on, no more heels. And we're just running to save lives. And. Um, for a leader who my team has always looked to me for answers, I didn't have answers for them. Um, but I was very transparent, so I wouldn't lose their trust. Um, and I worked side by side with them. Thankfully, our organization took the threat of COVID-19 seriously and prepared by having personal protective equipment for us, so we never run out of personal protective equipment at Northwell Health. But it was disappointing to see that my colleagues um, close by in city hospitals um, were uh, running into the fire, the burning building, without proper protection. And that was really um, heart-wrenching for us. Um, we felt the guilt, we felt the pain um, that they were feeling, and it's a position that we never want to be in again. And so equity, equity across all our hospitals in every part of the United States and around the world is very, very, very important. There were long days, um, there were sleepless nights, um, nothing in my educational preparation to be a nurse, 
I also went to business school and most recently received my doctorate in health sciences could have prepared me mm -hmm. for what we went through. Um, thank you for, for sharing those stories and, mm -hmm. uh, and that vulnerability. Um, I, I want to go from, from the experience in New York City, the urban context, to what COVID-19 was like in the rural context, um, and turn to you, uh, to you Adrian, uh, as well. Um, you, you have shared some harrowing stories you know, with the rest of us uh, before this session, but um, give us a glimpse into what it was like in that same moment that people were learning about this very rapid rise in cases and really wrapping our minds around what COVID-19 meant um, for a rural health system that has less resources to start with, what did that feel like for you? Yeah, thank you. And, and first, I do also still also want to say thank you for um, allowing me to give the rural perspective and to advocate for rural healthcare systems. And to the healthcare students in the audience, um, and I know we have at least one because my, my <laughs> oldest son, uh, Blake, is in the third row here, and he's a uh, public health major at the University of Texas. Um, I, I would go back to medical school all over again, despite all the challenges that we are eliciting. And um, you, you are needed. And um, so I, I just want to you know, make that, that true that, that I would do this all over again. I tell all of my trainees that because of the level of burnout that we have. But you know, the rural healthcare organizations, one is um, rural healthcare organizations, whether they be critical access hospitals like I practice out of, a 25 bed um, hospital with no intensive care unit, or it be a rural federally qualified health center where I do my ambulatory um, care at. They are like, I, I tell this to policymakers and legislators when I testify, they're like small football teams or small soccer teams and that the bench often is empty or it has very few on it compared to a larger urban organization. And so when somebody gets sick or somebody quits or somebody moves on, there may not be anybody to pull from the bench back into the game. Uh, and, and game is not the right word when we're talking about uh, caring for somebody's life. But what, what that happened on July 5th, 2021, this acute on chronic workforce shortage really hit us in the Big Bend region of West Texas, which is one of the most uh, medically underserved areas in the, in the United States. And we, I've been practicing there my entire career of 16 years, and we've never had to shut down a service line within the hospital. We, we always were short, but there was always somebody on the bench that we could pull in. And with the pandemic, and with um, what, what happened uh, with the burnout and um, rural healthcare organizations tend to not pay very well. And so you can't blame um, healthcare providers for wanting to do better for their family and going to higher needs area, predominantly in urban areas when we had these pop-up hospitals. And so on July 5th, 2021, we knew that our labor and delivery um, unit was staffed very um, lean with our labor and delivery nurses. And I'm a family physician that still delivers babies. Um, but we got a call, um, myself and my three family physician colleagues, we got a call from the chief nursing officer that effective immediately, our labor and delivery unit would be on diversion. Mm. And that means essentially closed. And so, you know, that's not a big deal if you're perhaps in an urban area and you can go a block or half a mile or a mile to the next labor and delivery unit. But this critical access hospital in Alpine serves about a 12,000 square mile area from Van Horn, Texas to Del Rio, Texas, all the way down to the Mexican border. And we serve about a 20, we capture and service about a 25,000 population within that 12,000 square mile area. So when we went on diversion, that meant that we could not deliver babies uh, with labor and delivery nurses in the labor and delivery unit. And so we had to transfer them from Alpine, 160 miles away to Midland or Odessa. And we, didn't, we don't have any ground EMS that can take patients and transfer. We, we're lucky to have EMS units and there's not ground. So that's a $50,000 
um, airplane ride when we can get them to come to our facility to transfer a laboring patient out. And if, if they're too far advanced in labor, then we have to deliver them in the emergency room with emergency room nurses who are not trained labor and delivery nurses. It's a very specific um, skill set that labor and delivery nurses have. And so I, I can tell you for certain that these laboring women that deliver in emergency room, we are not able to provide the standard of care that these women deserve. And once the woman delivers and the babies, we then have to make the decision, do we fly the mother, the postpartum mother and the baby that 160 miles to Odessa because we cannot hold on to them because our med surge nurses um, also don't have that skill set to take care of a newborn baby and a postpartum a mother. But unfortunately, most of the patients make the very difficult decision, I'm just going to go home and not receive that standard of care of at least staying 24 hours in the hospital, so. Wow. Um, Siobhan, you know, I, I know much of what Adrian is describing mm -hmm. uh, resonates with, mm -hmm. with you and your experience uh, in a tragic way. Um, I wanna bring in one other element to the conversation here uh, from your experience. Um, and I do this as the, the former head of a local health department as well. The title of this session is Why Work in Healthcare? Um, but we should also be talking about public health mm -hmm. and public health workers. Uh, there are about 300,000 public health workers um, across the United States, particularly in state and local health departments, and they have also felt the brunt of, of the pandemic. Uh, there's a CDC study that I'll always remember that showed that 53% of public health workers at least one sign of uh, a mental health mm -hmm. um, concern, whether it's depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so how should we think about the impacts on the public health workforce uh, and where we need to go with respect to shoring up um, uh, a workforce that has been disinvested in and decimated over years? Well, first I have to acknowledge what Adrian said because it, for a lot of, people, the pandemic significantly impacted their lives, but for healthcare, it was war. And just last week, the American Medical Association launched the Physician Recovery Plan from war, essentially. And, and his story is from a little known genre called um, healthcare horror. So, and my favorite of which is neutropenic on a plane. Some of you will get that. Yeah. It's very bad, <laughs> very bad, but this, uh, for the public health workers, I think it's all intertwined because you need to work with the healthcare systems and the healthcare staff to have a coordinated plan. And when they're trying to triage people in tents or turning parking garages into hospital beds, uh, housing, you can't interact with them. So it's, it's even harder uh, when it, everybody was stretched so thin. And public health is really, uh, been underinvested in and not established well enough. And you could really see in states at the time the pandemic hit, it was in North Dakota, or as we called it, North Dakota. We did not um, have enough infrastructure for public health to reach out. So, uh, you know, there's just so much that needs to be done, but I think we have to take the early, especially the early part of the pandemic as, um, you know, sheer crisis and how we recover from that now, I think is, is gonna be really tough, but um, there's been an uptick in both med students, I'm sure nurse, nursing students and public health students at the graduate level. So I feel like the kids are gonna save us. And one great story, and I, I won't give too many details because it's not my story to tell, but some med students figured out that there were factory workers in Mexico making PPE and they could not get vaccinated in Mexico and they could not go cross the border and vaccinate them. So they set up uh, a system and they vaccinated 2,400 workers by having them walk up to the border and then from the other side, they reached over and put the vaccine in their arm. Mm -hmm. So the kids are gonna save us is what I'm saying. And part of, it's all intertwined in a way as well because I feel like physicians, nurses, and other key people in healthcare, which let's face it, everybody is key in healthcare, uh, because they're 
fighting with the electronic med medical record or for reimbursement, they're not able to have that same creativity that, uh, that the med students are showing because they have a little extra time. Uh, so I think that's just something that we should consider when we, when we think about what next. So let's, let's dig a little bit deeper in the solutions. Um, we've, uh, we've heard the scale and the scope of the problem. We've heard how it is entrenched um, and it has its roots from before COVID, uh, but also the ways in which um, the pandemic has, has made, exacerbated you know, so much of it. Um, and you know, one of the things that always motivates and inspires me is what you were just talking about, Shaban, for us to build the health system that all of us wish we worked in, but more importantly, the responsibility of our generation to build it for your son, Adrian, and all of those other um, idealistic students who are coming up so that they can channel their idealism toward actually taking care of people rather than fighting the electronic health record or trying to get you know, basic funding. So, um, but I have to say, uh, you know, when we, th when we think about the solutions that are being discussed right now, whether it's, you know, marginal increases in funding or trying to change the way some health systems are thinking about well-being and wellness, they feel too superficial. They feel like they're not matched to the scale and the scope that we just talked about. So we're at the Aspen Ideas Festival. This is our chance to suspend disbelief what are those bigger, bolder changes that we ought to be calling for in our health system? And because nurses are the linchpin of this and we're facing such a staffing crisis with nurses, maybe Sandra, I'll ask you to start. Sure, um, so uh, just exactly what you said, Dr. Trotsky. Um, nursing is the backbone of any health system. We make up the largest um, health healthcare provider um, group, and so a health system without nurses is just impossible. So what do we need for nurses? Um, COVID has decimated, as you heard from Siobhan and Adrian, um, health systems across the nation, and we need to replenish that. Uh, but first, we need to make it um, attractive for people to want to come into nursing. And I do agree, Siobhan, that it's our young people that's going to save us. It, despite the challenges, it's still a rewarding um, field to get into, to be able to impact someone's life, someone's family life, a whole generation is incredibly rewarding. Um, it is predicted that by uh, 2030, this was in 2017, this prediction was made that approximately a million nurses will leave, would leave the profession. COVID exacerbated that, and those numbers, I'm sure, are off the charts now. So we need to make investment in nursing, and investment across um, you know, just all ethnic groups mm -hmm. so that we can serve all populations better and provide equity um, in care. So we need to um, have a pipeline um, for young folks who want to come into the profession, make it easier for them to come into the profession in terms of um, the cost um, to get into the profession. Um, transition, have a pipeline for where nurse in attendance can work and work towards becoming um, a registered nurse. We need to invest in nursing education um, for nurses, existing nurses, to thrive and grow and develop to meet the needs of, uh, of our populations. We need to invest in nursing schools, more space in nursing faculty so that our nursing faculty can provide the education that the nurses need. We need to retain um, the current nurses and not have brain drain where when you have a flood of nurses that come into um, the space that we have no one to train them. Um, we need to invest in the health and well-being of our nurses. We, we are broken. Mm -hmm. We are broken, um, in case you didn't know that. 
we are, we are very, very broken. And, you know, as nurses, you know, we're so used to helping that sometimes we don't show our vulnerability and, and ask for help, but we are broken. Um, and so to, to get us to stay, we need investment. We need equitable investments so that our rural nurses aren't suffering and the urban nurses are just, um, you know, gaining the benefits of those investments because they live in cities that can afford, sorry, afford to invest heavily. We need equity um, across the nation in nursing investment. It's a bold vision for the future of nursing. Adrian and then Siobhan. Sure, I, I'll echo that, Sandra. That was very well said. I think we all recognize that healthcare in our country is a privilege. It's, it's not a right, and it doesn't matter. I'm old enough to remember that when you had health insurance, that almost absolutely guaranteed you access to care and access to care that you could afford. And um, I, I'm wearing my school board uh, member hat right now. Many of our teachers in our school, they cannot afford the co-pays because of their low salary, um, their inequitable salary and unjust salary, um, that you know, we, we need to move this country towards um, moving it to that healthcare is, is a right for us mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be that it's a privilege. And I really think that the root cause of that is getting back to, I asked my trainees, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose this question to the audience here and I'll make it a little bit easier. Who do you think has the most effect in the, in the hospital or in the exam room, is it the nurse or the physician or is it the politician? <laughs> I argue with the medical students, well not argue, but I discuss with the medical students that I host and the residents that I host, it's the policymaker who decides whether or not to expand Medicaid. My state is one of 11 or 14 states in the country that has not expanded Medicaid. So that absolutely closes the door to many of my low income patients that deserve care and need to be taken care of. And so I think really the root cause is I was thinking at an event yesterday, each of us won, we have to vote, but I think we have to be running for office. Yeah. I think we, we. And, and, and beyond that of a school board member, um, you know, we have to be running for state and national office so that we are the ones setting the policy. We are the ones who know about scientific integrity. I would pose, I think, that we have some more empathy than perhaps some of our, our politicians. And so I think that, you know, really the, the root cause is that we, we have to be putting ourselves out there and running and setting the policies. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have one point of tension in this panel, and it's that there is one group in the U.S. with a birthright to healthcare, and it is members of federally recognized tribes. So, uh, but if you look at the data, their health is amongst the worst in our country. So, uh, part of the problem, even this is pre-pandemic, the the rate of physician vacancies in the Indian Health Service is 20 to 25 percent. Imagine trying to do your work without a fifth or a quarter of the doctors that you need. Uh, so that's, you know, I, I feel, and that's all wrapped up in also a lot of those areas are rural. So it's just hard to get uh, providers into rural areas. But I think my biggest point, and if nobody remembers anything else from this talk, please let it be this, that we need a paradigm shift that visits in person or even telemedicine is not the only way that there is healthcare delivered. And that messages and other interactions, phone calls with patients uh, needs to be valued and uh, so that physicians aren't just trying to um, keep the lights on and their clinic open, uh, but also give the care that people need. So that would be my takeaway. Thank you so much, Siobhan. We're gonna spend the last 10 minutes taking your questions, but before we get to that, um, I wanna do a couple of, uh, of lightning rounds. So, um, question for, uh, for all of our panelists, um, but your answers have to be 30 seconds or less. So, um, so let's start with this one, which I think flows from those uh, bigger solutions that you've already alluded to. Um, 
let's say you were in the Oval Office with President Biden and uh, you have this limited window to convey what you think needs to change around how we think about health workers and what the future should look like for them. So, Adrian, why don't you kick us sure, off? Sure, 30 seconds, okay. So, <clears throat> we have to have a healthcare workforce that is culturally um, competent and reflective of our nation. Um, I want to argue that rural students are an underrepresented uh, population in healthcare training programs. We need to be prioritizing and optimizing a certain portion of nursing schools, medical schools, and all the multidisciplinary healthcare training programs for our rural students that are disadvantaged academically because of underfunded public rural uh, schools. We have to expand the rural health workforce that's multidisciplinary from the community health worker mm -hmm. to the nurse, to the physician, to the behavioral health worker, to the social worker. Thank you. Sandra, I think you may have met President Biden. I think you were at the State of the Union. So um, what did you yes. tell him, or, or what would you like to I, I told him that um, we need to expand the nursing workforce to meet the needs of our population. We need to invest heavily in nurses that, are, that have stayed um, in, the, in the profession, and that an investment in, is in nursing is worthwhile an investment that he'll um, get maximum return on, in, on his investment, and an investment in nursing is an investment in humanity. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, I would keep it very simple, because sometimes with policymakers uh, who have 100,000 things that they're thinking of, you just, you have one ask. So mine would be fully fund the Indian Health Service Scholarship. Every year they turn down medical students who qualify, often who are native and are more likely to go back to their community or serve a native community, and they can't get funded through the Indian Health Service. So that would be my one ask. Thank you. Um, now turning from, from the United States president to uh, the folks who really matter. <laughs> um, the, Don't tell him that. <laughs> the, the students who are coming up, the health workers of tomorrow, um, people like, like Blake, um, if you had 30 seconds to, uh, to tell them why you love what you get to do, despite all of the challenges and problems, and perhaps in some cases because of those challenges, um, what's your, uh, w what would you reach for to try to inspire them? And Shaban, maybe you can get us started. Well, I would say I love what I do because Healing does happen person to person in a healthcare setting, but when you have bad policies, uh, you can't fix it with a person to person visit. So uh, public health really is incredibly important, especially the policy side of thing. I agree, that's one of the most important players when we're talking about ending health inequities and bringing in, I, I like the definition of health equity is optimal health for all. Sandra. So um, I would say to our youngsters that, um, you know, I see how much you care, the passion you have to, to solve the problems of the world, hunger, climate change. Well, health is one of those problems. We need your passion, we need your care, we need your energy, we need your stamina, we need everything that you have to join us um, in this fight to um, heal the nation and provide a stable healthcare system. Adrian. I tell trainees that their passion, their enthusiasm sustain me in what I do. And I tell them, find your calling. Don't think about the paycheck. Don't choose, with regards to medical students, don't choose the the, the specialty that pays you the most money if your heart is not in it, if that's not what you're called, mm -hmm. find your calling. I really view healthcare workers from the front office receptionist to everybody up and in between that that's delivering care as missionaries. And that's just a, an amazing profession to have, to work as a missionary and caring for others who may not have access to healthcare, would it not be for you and your team of the multidisciplinary healthcare team that we need to fully take care of patients. 
Thanks to each of you, and uh, you know, I'll just um, I'll just add briefly, inspired by your responses, actually, that uh, there are so few professions that exist where you can both take care of someone, you can bear witness to their struggle and their suffering, and use that and sublimate it into the change that we need in our world, um, whether it's via policy or whether it's uh, building a better health system for. Um, for the people that we serve, most importantly, uh, but for all of our colleagues as well. Um, so with that, let's turn to some Q&A from the audience. We'll start oh. on the left-hand <laughs> side and get to as many as we can. So gentlemen in the front row here. Hi, good morning, all. Uh, my name is Ewoma Agbaldu. I'm a medical student at Mayo Clinic and a, uh, an Aspen Health Fellow. I'm here with my wonderful fiance, uh, who's also a Health Fellow and a medical student at U of A Phoenix. And what we've actually done is create this program that's the Robin Hood of PPE, where we've collected over 500,000 uh, medical supplies that are unused and reallocate them, redistribute them to uh, safety net clinics and people who really need those in vulnerable communities. What we've seen is that those institutions with a high, a high population of Medicaid patients actually have worse access to PPE. So what can we do to address equitable uh, access to PPE for the healthcare workers that, that really need it. Thank you. Sure, I'll take that. I think, you know, an ally, part of our healthcare team, I, I've begun to realize that our healthcare team includes journalists that, that advocate and are our bullhorn, but also um, the, the Medicaid insurers. And so I don't know if you've already reached out to the Medicaid insurers. Amera Group is one of our big um, Medicaid payer in Texas, and they recently donated a um, manufactured home for us to host uh, trainees and rotating clinicians in one of our most isolated clinics down on the Texas-Mexico border. So they've been a wonderful ally. Okay, we can move to the next question. Hi everyone, Marco, University of Michigan Medical School, also a health fellow. So question, I'm hearing a lot about this, you know, burnout and stress with trained professionals, nurses, doctors, and then I'm hearing this big contrast to, you know, medical students that we have this creativity, this ambition, this drive to kind of make this change. And now I'm like thinking about the in-between, so residency, you know, outstanding debt, high like hours of work, low wage, what do you think could be done at this stage, like throughout training to, you know, to kind of keep this creativity and this ambition alive, which I would argue that often could suck it out. I'll take Tip that up. one. So I went to Harvard Med School, which I summarized as saying I was belittled by the best. <laughs> <laughs> There's a toxic culture in medicine, he, he, Adrian knows, um, that I think, you know, with, honestly, I'll say with, now that it's more women than men entering med school, hopefully some of that will turn around. Uh, but it, there's, there's a hierarchy and there's hazing, uh, specialties vary in how much that happens, but it's also just the sheer hours uh, that wear people down. And so, like, these first questions and the first folks we have, it's all med students, guys. I want you to recognize that the kids are trying to save us and everybody else is dealing with things that they shouldn't have to deal with. So I think that's the beauty of a panel like this at Aspen Health Ideas to say, let's think bigger and fix some of those pressures that are really beating out the ambition and ideas from our young people. Because, you know, Adrian and I started out in medicine very enthusiastic, as I'm sure as med students I can tell, and the system beats you down. I would also um, say that um, it's the same, some of the same solutions we, we need for, for nurses, um, where we're helping to manage those secondary stressors. Um, you mentioned debt from student loans, um, the high cost of childcare, um, elder care, just everything outside of work in the hospital that wears you down, that wears on your mind, that people come to work with and cannot then per perform, uh, give the best quality care that they know how to give. So I agree with you that we need some strategies to address those issues as well. 
And can I just add one point on this thread? Because I think it's such an important one, and, and I appreciate the question. You know, very often when we talk about solutions, we are more willing to talk about what someone else should be doing. The, the policymaker should be doing this. You know, the funder should be doing that. And a lot of what we've talked about in, in this, at least, when it comes to the organization of nursing and medicine, our training programs, the locus of control is, is with us. Mm -hmm. And so a, a lot of this is about turning the spotlight inward and saying, what is it that we need to do differently, that we need to shift, um, because that is our responsibility to do so for, um, for the folks who are asking the questions. Uh, let's move over on this side, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Bob Wales. I'm a physician from California and very involved in organized medicine nationally and, and statewide. And what we haven't talked about is our mental health, you know, uh, just how devastating it is. And this pre certainly predates COVID, mm -hmm. but I'd love to hear your comments about any ideas you have on increasing the workforce at all the levels, physicians, uh, you know, social workers, you know, psychological assistants, all of that uh, to help our crisis that we're experiencing now in healthcare with mental health. Yeah, and I will give a quick, quick anecdote. I was just recently on a call where we were trying to understand some data and literally the definition of burnout, a lot of people didn't, who are in medicine, didn't consider themselves burnt out unless they were feeling suicidal. Physicians, med students, we're in. We're like, yes, let's do it. And we, the, the only point at which they said, like, if I'm suicidal, well, then maybe I need to leave. So, you know, I feel like there's so many people wanting to go into medicine now. The rates of, um, or just the sheer number of applicants to med schools is, is continuing to rise in the pandemic. And what we need to do is look at how we can be more supportive. I think financially, Finances is a big deal um, because especially a lot of the folks who need the most care come from under-resourced communities where you don't have a lot of capacity to absorb all of the thousands and thousands of extra costs that come from being a med student. And I'm sure the same is true for nursing. It's just difficult. So you're already creating inequities in just who can even contemplate that career. I think we have a moonshot opportunity to, to expand the um, healthcare workforce right now by both our state and federal governments and our commercial payers working together in a public-private partnership um, to, to increase pipeline programs and to, to get those underrepresented uh, students that we need in, in healthcare so that our healthcare workforce nationally reflects our, our national population. We have time for one last question, please. Hi, I'm Gail. I'm the chief nurse at Houston Methodist, so good to see fellow Texans. Um, and um, you didn't mention at all um, kind of w nurses working to the highest level of their licensure. And I know at Houston Methodist, we're really, as a spotlight is on nursing, to really look um, at biotech to help us to do that with voice-activated charting, um, surveillance in rooms that when we turn a patient, it will automatically chart for, excuse me, for us. So um, I was wondering if there's any kind of spreadability of that nationally that you could look towards um, to help nurses to advocate for more um, tech uh, work to uh, expand and let us do what we know what to do. Um, I love those ideas. We don't have those at, um our health system yet, but you know, nurses have long been saying just the amount of paperwork and administrative work and non-nursing work that nurses have to do really takes away from the patients. And um, I agree that using uh, some technology that actually helps and not hinders, um, having scribes and more assistive personnel like some physicians do, um, would greatly, greatly help us to be at the bedside and really um, impacting care at the bedside with our patients, which is what they need. And those scribes are like the pipeline. 
or the pathway, as I like to call it, because pipelines leak, uh, because it, then they're seeing one-on-one -on -one what's happening and uh, really decide if it's, if it's what they want, because often it is. But you gotta try it. Absolutely. So we need to think differently, um, look at every, um, you know, profession in our um, healthcare organization differently, perhaps reorganize the roles of some of our techs, even our unit re receptionists. Every single person, I think we need to look at their jobs differently and, you know, how we can best utilize them to, um, to care best for our patients. Siobhan, Sandra, and Adrian, thank you foremost for what you did for your communities and for our nation during an extraordinarily difficult time uh, for all of us. And thank you for this wonderful panel. Please join me. <laughs>